So great. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Dear Hans, dear Eva, Director General Amano, Executive Secretary Serbo, Executive Director Nora Rockwood, Ambassador Christine Stix-Hackel, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends. As the Swedish ambassador accredited to the IAA, I can think of a few things as rewarding as hosting Hans Blix and his friends in Schwedenhaus. It is a great honor and joy to welcome you all to an evening of friendship, celebration, and of course the highlight of this event, a lecture by Hans Blix. Throughout his long career, Hans Blix has received widespread international recognition for his great achievements. In 2009, among many other awards, Hans Blix was appointed the title the Swede of the Year. And for decades, Blix has been one of the most important Swedish personalities on the international scene. Many of you know Dr. Blix from his 16-year period as Director General of the IAA. Others may remember Hans already from his term as Foreign Minister of Sweden in the 1970s. Most are also well acquainted with his accomplishments as Chairman of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Commission or as head of Anmovic in the early 21st century. All in all, it's a hugely impressive career and constitutes a significant contribution to international efforts for peace and disarmament. If more people possessed the stamina and strong personal devotion of Hans Blix, the world would be a much better and more peaceful place. Sweden is strongly committed to the United Nations and multilateral cooperation, in particular disarmament and non-proliferation. The Swedish government is consistent in its support, political and financial, to the IAA as well as to the CTBT. And in September, Sweden will join the Board of Governors of the IAEA. We look forward to continue our important cooperation in the fine tradition that Hans Blix very much embodies. Tonight, we celebrate the achievements of Hans Blix on, his on, the, on the occasion of his 90th birthday. For all Swedes in this room, this evening is a particularly fitting choice. Today, the 6th of June, is the National Day of Sweden. So on this day, we also pay tribute to the values and priorities of modern Sweden. Solidarity, equality, international peace and development, human rights, and a rule-based international order. Among the many friends of Hans Blix that are here this evening, I wish to express a special thanks to Laura Rockwood. Laura is the great mind and organizer of this wonderful evening. Thank you, Laura, and the VCDNP for an excellent cooperation. Before handing over the floor to Laura, I wish to introduce an absent friend. She could not join us this evening, but has pre-recorded a personal greeting to Hans. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce Margot Wallström, the Foreign Minister of Sweden. Dear Hans Blix. This is an early birthday greeting from Sweden to you in Schwedenhaus in Vienna. There is so much to say about you, about your long and impressive academic and professional career. Uh, there is so much to say about the fact that you are one of the most well-known Swedes around in the world. Uh, a movie being made about you. You've been in the media reports uh, since decades, uh, and uh, there is even a rock band uh, carrying your, your name. Uh, now, also a number of places around the world uh, that you have visited and will also forever be connected uh, with, uh, with you and your actions and your job. Um, Chernobyl, and of course, uh, Iraq as a, as a country. I think we have all admired you for your, for your courage um, and your professionalism and also your unwavering um, struggle and fight for disarmament, non-proliferation, 
uh, verification of nuclear weapons. And you are still actively engaged uh, in all those matters about disarmament, peace and security. And we've had uh, the privilege of being able to invite you to events also here at the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And you are one of my predecessors, uh, well recognized still. And the other morning I put on my TV and Hans Blix was there to comment as he always does in a, a very knowledgeable and uh, impressive way on events uh, in I Iran. Uh, I try to summarize um, what I uh, know about you and how I have met you. And I try to combine the, the things that I find uh, about you and would characterize uh, Hans Blix. I think you are a very young, old age person. I find that you are a practical scholar, that you are a strategic idealist that you are a warm-hearted hero, and that you are also a friend and role model, and will remain so for, I hope, another 100 years. Thank you very much, and congratulations. In Sweden, tack. Thank you, Ambassador, and may I take the opportunity to congratulate you and all of your compatriots on your National Day. What better occasion to celebrate than in the honor of one of your finest national treasures? Good evening and welcome. I'd like to thank all of you for being here with us, as well as those guests who couldn't join us, but who may be watching us via live streaming, which we're showing this evening. Hans Blix became only the third director general of the IAEA in 1981, just after the agency moved its headquarters from the Grand Hotel and the Ring to its current location at the Vienna International Center. There was another seminal event that occurred just a few years later. He hired me. <laughs> Taking a chance on a young lawyer, on a wing and a prayer, as they say. And I, for one, will always be grateful for the risk that you took with me. But there were other somewhat more tumultuous events that took place during his tenure. The 1986 Chernobyl accident, the nearly simultaneous demands on the IAEA in the early 1990s in mapping out and dismantling Iraq's nuclear weapons program, uncovering North Korea's clandestine nuclear activities, and verifying the dismantlement of South Africa's nuclear weapons. And last, but by no means least, the year's long effort dedicated to strengthening IAEA safeguards, culminating in the adoption of the first legal instrument for safeguards in 27 years, the Model Additional Protocol, a crowning achievement of Dr. Blix's 16 years of service. A diplomat of the highest order, Hans Blix met all of these challenges head on with grace and courage. Many of us in this room had the honor to share those challenges with him. Indeed, the IAEA is what it is today, in large part because of you, Hans. A person of such remarkable integrity that I heard it said that senior US officials who reportedly ordered the CIA to gather sufficient ammunition to undermine Hans, and by extension, the UN weapons uh, inspection program, were said to have been sorely disappointed when the CIA was unable to unearth any such information. Hans managed all of this while being a devoted husband to a fellow career diplomat, a very engaged father of two young boys, a terrific chef and host, and however briefly, a rock star celebrity sharing with George Clooney, Kim Jong-il, and the Queen of England, the somewhat dubious honor of being lampooned by wooden puppets in the slightly off-color movie, Team America. <laughs> Hans will be turning 90 this month. It's an event worth celebrating for anyone, but especially in recognition of a person who, in a city famous for its centuries of diplomacy, 
stands out for his steadfast contribution and commitment to international law, peace, and security. To honor him on this august occasion, I thought it might be appropriate to have a few of his friends uh, extend their own personal congratulations. And the first of these friends, unfortunately, couldn't be with us here tonight, but he did take the time to videotape some words in honor of his somewhat younger colleague. Ladies and gentlemen, direct from Moscow, Roland Timurbayev, one of the lions of the NPT. Dear Hans, I am speaking not only for myself, I am speaking of, on behalf of many of my compatriots who have known you, who have worked with you for years and years. We celebrate today your 20th birthday. It's a great day. And you came to IAEA at a time when the problem of non-proliferation was very difficult because a number of countries tried to, uh, to have this uh, ominous weapons. Uh, 80s and 90s, when you were Director General of the IAEA, South Africa, Ukraine, India, Brazil, and some other countries, they tried to get there, to get nuclear weapons. And you came at a time when it was necessary to strengthen the whole system of safeguards and control of nuclear weapons. Can you indicate? With the help of those many countries who support support you. Support you. And uh, it was a great contribution into the problem of getting rid of nuclear weapons. During that time, both the United States and the Soviet Union were reducing nuclear weapons and they reduced quite a lot. So they were trying to implement their part of the of the non-proliferation treaty, the treaty which in Article 6 demands that both of us and others should in in the spirit of goodwill, do everything in order to get rid of, of nuclear weapons. And I can, I want to especially mention the additional protocol of 1997, which you helped to create, which strengthened a lot the uh, safeguards system of the IAEA. So your contribution is tremendous and I want to congratulate you and to say how happy I am that I have a chance to say this to you with the help of uh, CNES, this organization which is led by Anton Kropov um, um, and, and I, I hope that you will hear my words as soon as this gets to Vienna. I now have the pleasure to give the floor to another one of my previous bosses and the current Director General of the IAEA, Yukia Amano. DG. Dear yeah, Ambassador, Dr. Hans Flix, dear colleagues, first I would like to congratulate you of your 90th anniversary. It is so nice to meet with some old friends here. When I look back, 
and the name of Dr. Hans Flix came into my life very early in my professional career. In the late 1970s, I was working as an assistant, as an assistant uh, to Ambassador Hisashi Wada. You may not know uh, Ambassador Wada, uh, but uh, he is now well known as the father of uh, Princess um, um, Masako. And until quite recently, he was uh, the judge of International Court of Justice, and he is considered to be perhaps the most prom prominent diplomat that Japan has produced. One day, uh, Judge Wada, at that time Ambassador Wada, told me, my classmate became uh, the foreign minister of uh, Sweden. His name is Mr. Hans Blix. And he said uh, he was the classmate of Cambridge, and Hans Blix was a very bright person, and um, uh, that is the person what I respected. And I thought, uh, Hans uh, uh, Wada was uh, the brightest person. I was curious how Dr. Hans Blix looked like. <laughs> Your name came to my life again in 81, 1981. Um, then um, and, um, uh, Director General Ekwan decided to retire, and some, uh, the first uh, Director General was uh, from the United States, uh, next was from Europe, so we thought uh, the, uh, the chance is uh, for Asia and Japan. The Japanese government nominated uh, Mr. Imai, uh, Ryukichi Imai, and some, uh, um, uh, the competitor was some Ambassador Shiasong from Philippines. Both of them are excellent um, um, uh, people, and they are so good that they cannot, um, uh, they competed too much, and the votes were completely divided. And uh, none of them made it, and the best one became the Director General. You became. And um, uh, we are very happy about that. Of course, we are a bit disappointed, uh, but at the end, we are very happy. <laughs> And it was uh, only in uh, early 1990s when I personally um, I met you. At that time, I was a young uh, director for nuclear power in the Japanese foreign ministry. And um, uh, you came to Japan every two years, almost regularly, um, to Japan. And I took you uh, to the Japanese uh, foreign minister, and I was listening to the conversation. I thought uh, that you would discuss uh, the global situation, uh, but in reality, um, uh, you talk about why Japan does not give uh, the, um, the visa um, quickly, why um, uh, some uh, access was not uh, that, uh, uh, that smooth. So I, I, I wonder why Director General uh, knows uh, such details. Now I find a secret. <laughs> oh. When I visit foreign countries, my staff give me a long list. So the problem is not uh, to, um, uh, to know the details, how to short, cut, cut short this list. After I became the Director General, I have the occasion uh, to look into the past documents. Uh, the nature of the, uh, the issues change, but the nature of the issues doesn't change. And I am always impressed how solid are the legal argument of yours. And um, uh, time has passed uh, that um, uh, the legal documents uh, that were produced under your leadership and guidance are very valid even today. And um, uh, Laura mentioned uh, um, uh, the additional protocol is a huge um, um, uh, achievement. And that is a huge gift for the IAEA. Lots of time has passed. Over 20 years have passed, uh, but the IAEA have not been able uh, to produce any document that is more effective uh, than the protocol, uh, additional protocol. When I became the Director General, uh, the number of um, countries uh, that, have, um, uh, that were implementing the additional protocol was uh, 93. So uh, I said, uh, during my tenure, uh, I'll bring it 100. In reality, it's now 132. So uh, what uh, you have done is now growing, and it should grow more. I have been, I have been following your path, but um, uh, in order that I can continue to follow your path, you have to do another thing. You need to stay healthy and active up to 100 years and beyond because I have the plan to live up to 100 years or more. 
Thank you very much. And thank you especially for joining us during this board week. We all know it's the June board week. It's the safeguards board week. And you probably have a few things on your agenda that might require your attention. So if you need to slip out, thank you for joining us, DG. I would now like to invite Lucina Zerbo, Sec Executive Secretary of the CTBTO, to say a few words. Lucina, thank you for joining us. Dear Hans, Ambassador Edwards, Director General Amano, Laura Rokut, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what a beautiful setting. And uh, I'm almost uh, you know, so emotional because Hans, uh, I tease Hans to say to people that he's a schoolmate, but I'll tell you guys why, and then I'll come to that. But what a beautiful setting and an opportune moment for you, Laura, to organize this and generously host by Ambassador Edwards at the Sweden House. So we are celebrating not only the magnitude of this place, but the magnitude of a colleague, a friend, a father figure to some of us, to what you've accomplished for so many years, and that is inspiring many of us as well. From your DG ship at the IEA to the chairmanship of uh, UN MOVIC and subsequently of the WMD Commission, there are few personalities in this world who embody the concept of nuclear verification like you, Hans. For the depth of your knowledge and the extent of the responsibilities over the years, including that of foreign minister, as mentioned by Margaret Wallström. You've been, you've been a guiding star to us all in the non-proliferation and disarmament community. But as those present today can set testify, Hans is much more than an exceptional diplomat and a revered expert. His integrity is impartiality, dedication to public service, commitment to the truth and passion for justice make him a very special friend and a colleague. We are fortunate at the CTBTO, Hans, to count you among the most active members of the group of eminent person. You don't know how humble I have I've been when you said and you agreed to join the group of eminent person that I initiated when starting my office as executive secretary. Hans, you're so active, in fact, that I'm almost inviting you to be part of the CTBT youth group. <laughs> so you remember we celebrate one of your birthdays in Seoul together. And uh, you know, when I heard, that was the first time I, I realized that you were over 80. And I said to myself, I can't believe that we're celebrating 80-something of Dr. Bliss because of your energy. But that's why I was wondering if we shouldn't verify this. Because, you know, in Africa, <laughs> sometimes uh, when we send, uh, you know, people to do sport abroad, uh, I mean, some argue that we reduce their age. And that's why you see them stronger and bigger when they come to the fellow European teams. So I want to verify your age. So you've been, I've, ra I've rarely seen somebody with such tireless vigor, the same vigor that enabled you to successfully steer the IEA through the Chernobyl accident. The revelation of Iraq's clandestine nuclear weapon program and the DPRK safeguard violation. The same vigor that allowed you to fulfill the WMD verification mandate in Iraq under fiercely challenging circumstances. I remember reading a piece written by you in The Guardian a couple of years ago in which you draw lessons from the 2003 invasion of Iraq. The first point that 
you mentioned relates to the value of international verification and to how independent and competent international inspection remain indispensable in diffusing controversies over nuclear programs. This is a message that resonates strongly with the CTBTO and its stakeholders. The contribution of the CTBT to international security resides not only in the strength of its purpose to prohibit all nuclear weapon explosion, but also in the effectiveness and credibility of its verification regime, which allows every single state, large and small, to monitor the globe for sign of nuclear explosion. For this reason, I believe that the CTBT is uniquely positioned today in today's divided world to bridge the gaps that have led to so many lost opportunities. We are ready to act as an indispensable confidence builder that Hans refers to in his article. Dr. Bliss, eminent person Hans, to you and to your wife, Eva, I want to apologize because sometime in Sweden, you came up very early in the morning to have breakfast with me at my hotel when I was invited. I'm very touched and I want to say thanks to Eva because I've also called you as well in late hours because you say, Lasina, you can call me anytime. <laughs> I was humbled to share the stage with you in many occasions, but Moscow, I remember the security conference was one of the highlights. Sitting with you, listening, to myself and listening to you and watching the TV and realizing that I'm sitting next to such a figure was very humbling to me. So you are an inspiration to me, Hans. So, but you are an inspiration to all of us. And I know that when I say this, I speak for your country, Sweden, and you've heard it, who has contributed in so many ways to non-proliferation and disarmament. I also speak for the international organization that have relied on you so many times, and I speak for the world as a whole, which you have actually made a safer and better place. Happy birthday, dear friend Hans, and many, many, many more returns. You've said to me, Lasina, give me time to finish my book, because I might not have a lot, but I wish you more and more returns to finish your book to read it, for your grandkids to read it, for our grandkids to read it. You are an inspiration to me. Thank you so much, Hans, and thank you for having us. Well, before I give the floor to uh, Dr. Blix for his lecture, I would like to introduce Ambassador Christine Stix Hackel, the Austrian permanent representative to the IAEA and ambassador to the UN organizations in Vienna who will speak on behalf of our host country, Austria. Ambassador. Dr. Blix, Madam Blix, distinguished guests, excellencies. First of all, I would like to thank Helen and Laura for giving me the opportunity to speak here on this really very, very prominent occasion with this setting which we owe to you. So thank you very much. Um, to be the seventh speaker is a small challenge. Uh, it embraces the risk to have repetitions, which I don't think are a vice on this occasion, uh, but I'll do my best uh, to give the aspects of the host country, and so I'm glad to have this opportunity to add some few words on behalf of Austria. As a country firmly committed to the non-proliferation and disarmament of nuclear and other weapons of mass uh, destruction, and as the host country of EIA, Austria has a twofold reason to be grateful to our guest of honor, Dr. Blix, tonight. During his tenure, 
at the helmet of the agency, the organization had to face great international challenges, which we have already heard of. On the other hand, there were also years of positive developments in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, such as the conclusion of the CTBT, the dismantlement of South Africa's nuclear arsenal, and the renunciation at nuclear arms by Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Thanks to the energy and foresight of Dr. Blix, the agency did not only come to terms with these developments, but became a key protagonist in them. In so doing, the EAEA was also instrumental in forging international instruments which still serve us well today in many situations long after the specific events that led to their creation. As a result of these achievements, the authority of the EIA had grown significantly by the time Dr. Blix retired in 1997. For this achievement, Austria is obviously as profoundly grateful to Dr. Blix as all other members of the agency. But as the organization's host country, Austria's gratitude to him is at least as great again. I can assure him that besides all his impressive other merits, we are much aware of the outstanding contribution he has given to making Vienna the well-established and appreciated place of international dialogue and cooperation. One can certainly say that Dr. Blix left his successors an excellent foundation on which to base their efforts, but also a pair of truly big shoes to fill. Luckily enough, the EIA and its member states were blessed with, by, with two successors of Dr. Blix, who both rose to this daunting task in an impressive fashion, one of them having here opposite DG Amano. This is all the more vital as the agency and with the international community continue to be confronted with important challenges. While nuclear disarmament today is mostly associated with the DPRK, it is a much broader challenge addressed to the international community as a whole and particularly to all states possessing nuclear weapons. As it was once famously remarked, there are no right hands for the wrong weapons. We all should consider us very lucky that Dr. Blix is, continuously, is continuing continuously to closely follow current international developments to be available to share his views and his advice. With this, I add myself to all those congratulators who warmly and gratefully congratulate you on, in that case, on behalf of Austria to your 90th birthday. And it's always a very special event to have you back here in Vienna. My warmest congratulations to Thank you, Ambassador, and that was an excellent segue to our next speaker. Dr. Blix has generously agreed to share with us some of his own thoughts on war and peace and the state of the world in which we live. At the conclusion of his lecture, we will have a very short period for some questions and answers, but for now, Hans, the floor is yours. I have manuscript. <laughs> Thank you. Ambassador Edwards, Laura Rockwood, Excellencies, friends, students. Uh, it's a somewhat overwhelming experience to be here. Uh, Laura and I talked about my giving 
a lecture at our institute, and I've been there once before, and I had cherished the idea to talk about some current problems. But Laura <coughs> then was in touch with the Swedish ambassador, and the format changed somewhat, and I'm most profoundly grateful for the kind words, and overwhelming words that have been directed to me. I'm also overwhelmed by the many old friends who are here, and with whom many of whom have collaborated very well in the past. And messages from the Swedish Foreign Minister and from my old friend Roland Timmerbayer, who, as you, many of you will know, was one of the fathers of the non proliferation Treaty. Uh, he was ambassador here in Vienna, and we were good friends, and he had a car marked CD, as you may imagine, but it meant Corps de Disarmers. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he really incarnated the Disarmers, and I was happy to congratulate him on his near 90th anniversary in Moscow last autumn. So it was very wonderful to listen to him here. I'm grateful and overwhelmed by these things. And I also appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you. Um, and I'm glad that no one asked me, when will you retire? <laughs> uh, because it might have an under meaning that I'm not so happy. Um, I simply got the question, I usually answer that uh, I'm, I have retired three times, I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> I'm retired from the Swedish Foreign Service and from the IEA and from the UN. And I'm not going to retire from the book, but I'm hoping that I will finish and uh, hope that it will not finish me. <laughs> well, what do I do then now that uh, I'm free from obligations? <clears throat> Crosswords? No, not, never. <laughs> Thrillers? No. Grandchildren? Yes, to some extent. And, uh, but, but mostly for the, the book that I'm hoping to finish. There are different phases in life, as we all know. And uh, the first is the student time, and I was happy to be a fellow student of, of Hisashi Iwada in Cambridge, who became a famous Japanese ambassador and judge in the court of The Hague. And we were free. And then there were years in government, under working for the government, and then for a short time as a boss of the foreign ministry. And, <coughs> and then in the IEA. <coughs> as a boss in the foreign ministry, you have you have no other bosses over you except the chef, chef de protocol <laughs> and the prime minister. But you have a hundred enemies and you spend your time fighting the enemies in internal politics. As the head of an international organization, you really have no enemies to fight, but you have a hundred bosses. <laughs> and rather than fighting them, you try to unite them. So there's a big difference going from the civil, from the government service into international. Uh, now, leaving the IEA, I went to Unmovik in New York uh, in 2000, 2003, and um, from after that, I dealt with the weapons of mass destruction in the commission, and we produced a report that was still valid, unfortunately, because all the good proposals that we uh, laid before the world, uh, none of them has been implemented, so it still remains there, <coughs> unfortunately. And then I've sometimes been of some use to Lassina Serbo in the CTBT, but the time, life is so thrilling anyway. You don't need any, any detective stories, any creamies. You will just read the newspapers. And uh, I think that fills my, my day and my thrill, and, uh, and if you need any adrenaline in the morning, it's just to open the newspaper. I have the New York Times in the morning, and I read the news, news from the IEA, the daily re releases. I read the lady the releases from the CTBT and also from the UN Disarmament Department in New York. Now that gives quite a lot of things to chew on and to worry about. It's thrilling, it's thrilling every day. Now to see Mr. Trump as the Prince of Peace, for instance, today and these days is very thrilling and uh, exciting. And I confess I feel some little optimism on the no North Korean thing. I think that they are from the idea of having a, a total delivery of 40 to 60 bombs on silver plates to the thoughts that now seem to be there. But this is a, to denuclearize. It's not just to put things on the table, bombs on the table. It's a process. It's a big establishment, and it will have to be in a phased manner. So I feel some hope that this will work out. Uh, I think the very best, Vasina, would be if the U.S. were to suggest to North Korea 
that they should jointly bring the CTBP into force by the North, North Korea and the US and China and the other necessary to come to join in one go. That would be much better than simply get the North Koreans to come in. <coughs> now, the, my main task, as you have understood, is the working on a book, uh, which is, deals with the restraints on the use of force between independent gr human groups. And I will discuss that in a moment to give you some uh, inklings of where, where I am. Uh, and I promise you, I not start with the Greeks. I do actually, in the book, I start earlier with the hunter and gathering societies and the, and the Code of Hammurabi, which uh, we also have in the lobby of the IEA. Uh, so I'm not going quite that far. But I will say at this outset that the 16 years of my life, professional life, that I had in the IEA, I felt were the most productive period of, of my life. And also, perhaps the most enjoyable years of my life in relations with the staff, with hosts and with missions. And the first message I would say is, is this, that the long haul that we had in trying to develop an international community, this is our mission. International organizations are not that old. The postal office began in the 19th century, but uh, essentially a whole crop of them came into being at the end of the Second World War. And to gradually build up these international institutions is a great task and one wonderful to be in it. And I was enabled then to take part in this. And I sometimes remember the, the word of a Swedish philosopher from the beginning of the century. It's very simple. He said that as a, as a way of working a life that if you find a horseshoe in your meadow somewhere, the least you can do is to throw it homeward. The least you can do to contribute, at least to bring it a little closer. And that, I think, is what one can aspire for, not great things. In there may be some presidents, heads of government can do that, but most of us, if we can contribute somewhat, and this, I think, is what I did and what my friends did here in the IA and what you do today. It's a patient, long-haul work. Reward is a new fabric of the international society, a fabric of international law, conventions, and ser international services as well. And they serve an expanded use of nuclear energy, not only nuclear power, but in agriculture, health, and in, in, in industry. The infrastructure, the conventions, is, a, is the most important part of it. It's, it's the law, and uh, it underpins all these ac activities. It's a bit paradoxical and perhaps sad that the best opportunities for progress is when they're being calamitous. Governments and and the world works best after calam like calamities. That, that's the time when we pull up our socks and do something. Chernobyl was one such calamity, and it led to many things. The safety convention, two conventions on early warning and on assistance, and a lot of other things. The work at Chernobyl is, is long haul. I myself be the chairman of the uh, group of governments that uh, helped to finance the shelter, new shelter over the re destroyed reactor. And it's still ready, a beautiful French design. And it's uh, one of the biggest buildings in Europe, uh, stands there ready and will be in operation at the end of this year. Iraq, of course, 1991 was another calamity. And it also led to many disasters, but men also to the 93 plus 2, an initiative that was taken in the safeguards department. And that was then developed. And the key person in was Laura Rockwood. And it was. Uh, uh, at their exclusive safeguards department. Um, and it's as <coughs> Direct Romano said a while ago, this, is, this was a calamity led to a vital strengthening of the safeguard system, which now comes to important use in Iran and in North Korea and all over the world. And I congratulate you on having attained over 130 uh, ratifications of the additional protocol. <coughs> Has the Vienna spirit helped? We often talked about the Vienna spirit. And uh, yes, to some extent. I mean, the political difficulties are the same, but Vienna has the advantage of not being in the media glare every day. Sometimes, but not every day. And I think that is an advantage, because some things become much more difficult with the media glare on it. So that should, um, apart from being, Austria being a, a government that is very helpful and positive in, uh, in, in, in bringing the international center and making the international organizations work. 
So I think the, the location of Vienna is good to be one of the main seats of the, U, of the UN. The staff, the relations with staff, of course, was another major uh, happy part of, of my life. I like to work in teams with other people. I think it's also indispensable. You can't do something, everything yourself. It's indispensable to work with others. And I, the cosmopolitanism of the course is attractive, I think, in this world is getting more of that and, and not less. I remember hearing a story about an executive <coughs> who said that he, he liked to have an exchange with his, his staff. And uh, the exchange, by that he meant that he liked them to come in with his, his, their views and walk out with his. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that's perhaps the idea of <laughs> relation. And, and I, I hope I of, more often listened to them and were impressed by them. And indeed, with the expertise that exists in so many areas in the IA, any leader will have to listen to, to that. <clears throat> so my first message, really, the second message is, the importance of a, pro a professional and unbiased international, ci international civil service. Civil service is also in government important because politicians have their agendas and, and they have their elections and they feel obliged to, to do that, do what they shall, but they also need a dossier of facts. And in these days, facts are expensive, <laughs> sometimes a bit too rare, but they, the politicians must have these on the table. And that goes for government goes also for international government, very much so. And I think that's what I, the testament I would like to leave after the, the IEA, uh, stay close to professional and unbiased independence, the same thing with the CCBPU. This is a great help in the international community. <coughs> the second um, message I think is the increased use of scientific approach. Uh, we, it's not just uh, cabinet uh, politics, but, but use of, of science. Nuclear is a war, the risk of nuclear war is a result of science, but also remedies of, of acting on it need to be, be scientific. And they include in the institutional sphere, they include the IEA and the CTBT, and UNSCAR, which one doesn't mention very often, but UNSCAR is the United Nations Scientific Committee, Commission on e e e e Atomic Radiation. And it's very important, a very professional commission, great use. The climate fear, climate change and risk is the same way. We also have caused it, this, our science has given us the fossil fuels and the energy, but also dealing with it needs science. And IPCC, I think, is an absolutely indispensable part of the, um, of the international community's response to it. Cyberspace, cyber uh, war and cyber means and space are also the areas that give new challenges for if we are to cope with it capably, then we must use science. Now, I've turned to my, my main preoccupation these days. Can international society become any wiser in tackling the use of force, of war? Um, I'm at the agency and in disarmament, I'm more specialized, but this is a broader subject. And of course, at the present time, when looking around the world, one has, has not very good grounds for being optimistic. There are still $1,700 billion a year is vote devoted to, to military expenditure, 15,000 nuclear bombs, uh, and actually at the present time, a race, an, an armaments race, not a disarmament, but an armaments race. And we find that we are outsourcing fine fighting, outsourcing fighting, black quarters and others, so the Russians also have some, and uh, you see some agreements are in risk of unraveling. The CFE unraveled a long time ago, the Conventional Forces of Europe. The ABM was ended, the INF in some jeopardy. The NPT is under tension at any rate, but still holding him. The CTBT, I'm glad to say, is still holding on and moving forward. And in disarmament, verification is also standing strong and doing a very, very vital role in the case of Iran and the case of North Korea. And despite the, the negative and dangerous features today, it's also that the world has changed. Some, some people say there will always be war, there always will be wars. But they should be aware that the world has changed over history. And I read with great interest in the past year the, the British, the English philosopher Hobbes from the 16th century. He saw man, and Augustine from the 4th century was the same way, saw the man and woman, women too, but mostly men, <laughs> as greedy, and violent and as robbers. 
but they could be, said Hobbes, they could be held uh, tamed, provided that you had a state with strong laws and a strong ruler, Leviathan, we call, call them. And it did work in the state sector. States have, we have mostly relatively peaceful societies, not everywhere, but in most places, peaceful societies. And we have the laws and we have the enforcement. But Hobbes didn't think that this was a recipe or any valid for the international community. There you saw only anarchy and chaos. And that was pretty true in, in, the, in the 16th century. The world has not become a state, and it will not become a world, we will not get a world federation in a very short run, but that will certainly take time. And indeed, I think today we don't want to have a one state. We will we stick to some multi multipolar, uh, perhaps not bipolar, perhaps not tripolar, but a multipolar world where everybody can speak up. We don't, General Assembly is not going to become a, a legislator, world legislature, and Security Council is no stern leviathan. Nevertheless, <coughs> states have lost some incentives to go to war and violence, and there are some new disincentives to use armed force. So we should be notice these, these changes. Conquest of territory is not a very common thing. We, there are exceptions. We have the Kuwait, we have the Russian uh, absorption of the, of the Crimea, but conquest is something rather rare nowadays. Change of borders is also not something very common. It used to be, you know, to grabbing a piece of land and a border was a common thing. But with m free movement of capital and free investment and free trade, borders are not quite so important. Yes, they become important in immigration, but not otherwise. And therefore, you do not see so many attacks on borders. Unification has also been an important factor, reduced number of wars. If you look at the time of the Roman em Holy Roman Empire, there were many, many states, and, and, and there were many, many fights. And with the unification, it reduced very much. And of course, with the European Union, it is also gone. The European is only unthinkable of having an armed conflict within the European Union. So unification is important. Something I call, you know, familiar with the expression MAD, mutual assured destruction. But I also coined the expression MED, M-E-D, mutual economic dependence. Well, it makes some importance. If you go to conflict, then you will also destroy a lot of the economic advantages that you have from the international economic cooperation. <coughs> now, I don't deny that counterforce is and det new military deterrent is important. <coughs> I often meet with friends who are uh, in pacifists, and they will <coughs> don't like very much to recognize that also the military force can be deterrent. I think I will not deny that it has so, such an importance. And indeed, in the nuclear field, <coughs> I think it is true that the Cuban crisis in 1962 played a very big, very, very big role. They, they, they both, the Russia, Soviet Union at the time and the United States at the time, they knew the tremendous powers and destructive power that they had, and they shied away from it. They found a diplomatic solution. They shied away from it, and that was a, le a lesson. Now, we, many of us certainly would like to see it do away with the nuclear weapons, because it's true, as long as nuclear weapons exist, there's a risk that it can be, they can be used. But at the same time, we must also realize that the existence of this mutual deterrent is something that instills a certain caution in the great powers to hold them back. And, the, and they will not go for disarmament. I mean, I welcome the treaty on, on against nuclear weapons that have come, but, I, but no one imagines that this is going to lead to a, to a, a, a disappearance of the nuclear weapons. They will still be there. And they will serve also as for states to, to a restrain, to go into anything that can escalate into nuclear war. We have had 70 years now, no direct armed clash between the nuclear powers. And that is telling. It could, could also be luck. And Bill Perry, who was a member of my commission, he writes about the many occasions when he felt it was really luck that prevented a nuclear war. And I also think that the development of smaller, so-called more usable nuclear weapons, is a terrible development because that will lower the threshold and we should certainly higher the threshold. But the fact that the, the weapons exist in the background is a memento not to go into too, too big conflicts between states that have a nuclear weapon. There will be war in the future, wars between the United States, regional wars, civil wars. But as to wars between states that have nuclear weapons, it's more questionable. That's basically the, uh, the hope that they will scare each other. Now, so much detente, of course, is, is, is an effort in this. And uh, we should, 
is wish to come back to the Bietant of the 90s. We are not there at all. The third factor I'd, I'd like to mention here are the development of norms. Now, if we talk about non-use of force in society, we think of the penal law. We think it's prohibited to kill or, or hurt somebody else, and you get judged and you get sent, sent to court, and that was Hobbes' idea of taming the wild in individuals. Now, why not do the same thing in the international sphere? Why do not have norms in the international sphere? Yes, we find effort to do that. And St. Augustine in the fourth century was the first who talked about just and unjust wars. And it was a doctrine that was valid for 1,000 years. But whether the, the secular rulers actually cared much about it, that is another matter. And they, they did not try in the secular field to, to introduce norms. In, the, in the, the, the conference of 1648 in Westphalia, Westphalian peace, there was no, nothing in the agreement that laid down norms against the use of armed force. Balance of power, yes, but not uh, do, then no norms. And even here, in 1815-15, the Vienna Confederation, that was tremendous of importance. Uh, there was also no effort to create a norm against the use of force. But Vienna, 1815, was the birth of multilateral treaties. And it started with international rivers in Europe, you might not remember. But that was the beginning of it. Since then, you have had a flood of international multilateral agreements. And today, you have walls full of conventions. That actually is the substitute that we have in the international community for legislation. We don't have a legislature. We have the substitute, somewhat deficient, but nevertheless a working substitute for legislation in international conventions. And um, so uh, as a lawyer, I think that yes, this is an important area. It's not quite as strong as the as law in the, in the national sphere. You don't have the enforcement means, but in fact, governments uh, respect the conventions mostly, relatively well, relatively, not as strong, as good, but nevertheless, it is, it, the world would, would not work if we don't have these conventions. We could not fly, we could not use the internet. There are lots of things we couldn't do unless we had this, this infrast legal infrastructure built on conventions. That was began, began in Vienna in <coughs> 1815, but not the norm against, against the use of force. And, and at those days, they thought more of arbitration and disarmament. And that was also the idea behind in, in, the, in the 20th century, in the League of Nations. They saw peace in, the, in, in disarmament and in arbitration, and it failed. It was not enough. Now, <coughs> the, the norm only came, really, with uh, the UN Charter in 1945. Recently, some people also talk about the Brian Bjorn Kellogg Pact in 1928, the year of my birth, <laughs> as the year when they really got a norm against the use of force. And it's very in interesting, and, and the, the Kellogg Pact had a great importance, not, a, not least as a basis for the, for the uh, criminal, uh, for the Nuremberg uh, judgments. Uh, so that was important, but UN Charter, Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter is the fundamental rule against the use of force. And, uh, the, and the UN Charter and the, and the US and others who, who framed it, they did not stop and, and content themselves with this norm against the They also built an infrastructure, institutions, to enforce it. And that was the Security Council. The Security Council could take decisions that are binding upon mem member states under Article 25 of the Charter. So there was a whole infrastructure built, built up. Now the, but of course, as you know, well, one, one could say, in a way, that the Security Council is a world government, but it's a world government that is also very, very handicapped by the rules of procedure that require a unanimity, or at least consensus, among the great, great powers. Uh, sometimes when I'm feeling very irreverent, I feel that the, in 1945, you had the five victor states, and they created the Security Council that took resp asked for responsibility to uh, keep order in the world, that they were like the five warlords, so we have a junta of warlords in command of the world. But uh, as many warlords sit together, they don't always agree between themselves. And it's only when they de do agree between themselves. And I think that we as citizens of the world can demand of the security, of the members of the security, who ask to have this responsibility, demand that, that they also live up to it. And that they not only go for their own national interest, but also act as the, as the executive committee of the world, representing the General Assembly. No, we are not there yet, but we do see some examples where they succeed. And I think then of the uh, Iraq in 1991, the intervention by the World Community Decision of the Security Council. I think also of the 
uh, Syrian chemical intervention against the chemical weapons with uh, Russia and the United States together brought Syria into the Chemical Weapons Convention. It was unanimous in the Security Council, or at least consensus. And the, the deal with about Ira Iran in 2015 was also a success. It may come unraveled, we don't know, but it was a success where the, where the members of the Security Council, the permanent members, succeeded in, in agreeing. Now, interventions will uh, probably remain. Local, regional, and civil wars will remain, and intervention we've seen have remained, but they're somewhat discredited. This, this, is, not, this is not conquest. Interventions are more, more limited per object, and in time, and, and in, in, in intention. And uh, I think with the Iraqi war, it was somewhat discredited. Obama called it a dumb war, and I think he was right. And I think he showed also in his own political action that he, re he refrained from some intervention. The U.S. did not play a major role in the Libyan war. It's somewhat bad. They were there, but not a major part of it. And in the Syrian affair the, with the chemical weapons, uh, he, Obama shied away from anything military, any intervention, and found another solution. And in the Iran affair also, he avoided that. He didn't want to have a war, didn't want to have use, but long, long negotiations. So intervention too, hopefully, will be become more Obama than it did. Whether Mr. Trump will do so, I'm not so sure. He has already used intervention twice to punish Syria for the u in for use of, of we chemical weapons and acting, you know, thus acting in my view as a world sheriff. And we have not in the UN, we have not appointed anyone to be a single world sheriff. The e European Union, I think, has a better line in the, their strategic document, they, they say they strive for rules-based order for in a multipolar world. And I think that's, that is, as a lawyer, I feel very warmly for it. I think it also is one that brings a lot of cooperation and better chances to peace. Well, will Russia and China and Mr. Trump agree to a rules-based order? That remains to be seen. I think one feature, and I almost end on this point, is that the psychology is important. Pride and humiliation are important factors in, in, in the world today. It's very hard for rulers and for governments to make concessions, especially in the glare of publicity, and it has to be, be hidden often. And uh, in the Cuban affair, it was very, very important in 1962 when they found a solution, and they hardly dared to demonstrate that the U.S. Has go had gone along with a, di a diminution of the missile activities in Turkey. And this was a sort of a saving face for, for Khrushchev on, on that side. So overcoming pride is, is a very difficult thing. And I will end by citing a poem by a Danish poet whom I like very much. And he wrote during the, during the ten, tense period of the Cold War, he wrote a little verse that led like this. The noble art of losing face may one day save the human race. Well, that is a very hard art, I think, to lose face, and it's very different. So I added myself a little poetic effort to end this lecture. And that is, let diplomacy be the noble art that prevents an upset of the nuclear apple cart that saves the famous ruler's face and allows him to withdraw with grace. Before we, before we close, um, I just really want to sincerely thank the Swedish Embassy, in particular the Ambassador Helen Edwards and Pascal Gestal, where are you Pascal, in the back, um, and the Friends of Hans who have contributed to this event, as well as Tariq Rauf who helped with the organization, and of course the staff of the VCDNP. One of the most important members is Mara Fenaisel, and our two interns, Minji Kim and Natalie Sudakavova, and of course, Artem, our resident photographer in the back, for helping to put this event together and actually pull it off. And finally, Ambassador Kitano and the Japanese um, uh, mission for contributing the guest book in which I hope you will all feel free to leave some thoughts of your own on this occasion now. May I invite you all to gather just outside in the Winter Garden 
so that we can raise a glass in honor of Hans and wish him a proper happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs>